Boats have been the most important thing in my life, and I've often wondered why. And I've gone back in my memory, and it's centered on the figure of my mother, who really introduced me to sailing, and that is why they are so important to me now, that I am at 80 years old looking back on a life based on boats. Josie Choate Spencer lived only to the age of 47 on a regime of horses, sailboats, and terriers. But my mother celebrated her existence like few women I've known. She never worked a day in her life because she didn't have time for it. It was a different age. Those born in 1904 like her were different people. Life perhaps felt more fragile to them or time more precious. I was only 11 years old when she died after coming in from a summer cruise on her 42-foot yawl at Quisset, Massachusetts with my father. She died of heart failure, but I remember her yachting outfit and that day it was three-quarter length canvas pants, a white blouse, a floppy white hat, her blue topsiders, and how I envied the two of them. And the next day, she was dead. That boat, one of the most important boats in my life, was a gift to him from her. My father returned in one piece from the 8th Army Air Force and World War II in 1945. It was his second world war. She took him up to Falmouth, Massachusetts to a cavernous shed in McDougall's yacht yard where a boat was stored for the winter. It was a cruiser racer designed by John Alden and built by Quincy Adams Yacht Yard in 1936 for Frank Bissell the vacuum cleaner magnet. The boat had won races and would again. And Josie was a rich young woman in 1946, the year of that gift. Her parents, a Boston Brahmin lawyer and his wife, who came from the Burnett Vanilla family, had died one after the other 15 years before, and she had not run through her inheritance. She might have gone to college, but she tossed aside her acceptance letter at Radcliffe and said that she didn't have time for teachers. They were too boring. Sailing was a passion for her, for she had a passion for every season. In the fall, it was horses, hunting with Maryland, Westchester County, New York, and Pennsylvania fox hunting packs and later in Ireland during the late 20s. Winter was her time for dogs, her numerous Norwich Terriers, which she bred and showed, often traveling to England to buy special sires. But summer was sailing. The tiny Woods Hole Yacht Club still records her wins in the Cape Carter class knockabouts in the mid 20s. And the Choate family house where she summered as a girl still stands near the end of Penzance Point, which is now one of those annoyingly gated and guarded reserves on the edge of Buzzards Bay and Vineyard Sound. Josie was of medium height, slim and graceful. She was a team captain at her Connecticut prep school, Westover, a girls' school. She was never in skirts or dresses, choosing instead jodhpurs or blue French pants, a man's hat or a beret and a wasted tweed jacket and beautiful shoes made in London by Tetzek, one of the city's best. There was a single gold chain on her wrist, but no wedding ring. She married my father in 1937, having divorced her first husband, a professor, Elliot Perkins, in 1935. 
But while still married to Perkins, who was a legend as a longtime master of Lowell House, Harvard, she was in England during sailing season when she heard of a ship sailing from Victoria Dock to Mannheim, Finland. The boat, which would appeal to Josie, was nothing like today's wedding cake cruise ship. The boat was a full-rigged barkentine, an iron ship fresh from a voyage to Australia for grain, run by the famous house of Gustav Eriksson. It was 1933, and Eriksson had found a way to make money from old wind jammers, though almost every other shipping company had sensibly turned to steam and propellers. Some of the Ericsson square riggers, their names still ring through our time. Ponape, Penang, Palmern, Herzegon Cecily, Archibald Russell, Grace Hawar, Barrowdale, and scores of others less famous than these. Viking, built in 09 in Copenhagen, was one of these. Still sound, built of nearly indestructible iron plate with steel masts and manned by a small crew of under 30, she sailed round the world, vying for bulk shipments, proving that wind and men could still move heavy cargoes of grain or fertilizer and make money doing it. Her last time from Australia to Liverpool was 86 days. She is still afloat today as a city ship at Gothenburg, Sweden, but now as a tourist attraction with 26 rooms and a large restaurant. But in June 1933, she was heading back to Mariham for her yearly refit. It was part of Ericsson's routine for the big ships, out to the Antipodes for cargo, back to Europe to unload, back to Mariham for paint and repair, then out again. This system worked right up until the day Germany declared unrestricted sea warfare in 1942, when submarines and surface raiders destroyed or captured such ships. Viking escaped an attack from just such a raider in 41, before Hitler's decree. Viking was right up Josie's line. To buy a passage, not on a fast steamer, but on a sailing ship. To see Finland on a holiday. Take as many pictures as she could with her Roliflex. And Elliot Perkins went along with it. She had caught some of the intoxicating smoke of the days of square sail and had inhaled deeply. The square rig sailing ship is less than a memory now. There are very few alive who've ever seen a full rig ship in action. For even the tall ship festivals are imitations, stagecraft, not part of the working world of bills of lading, delivery, and commerce. But this white ship was real. Her sails were furled on the yards. The crew was making all ready for the tow to sea. Ericsson was still operating. She would not know it. But even in 33, Viking and her sisters were going, as Sea Captain Lincoln Concord laments in a great introduction to Roll and Go, Songs of American Seamen, written in 1924. And I have to quote, one by one, the few remaining deep water sailing ships are disappearing. They drop away and are heard of no more. With them, goes much that is incalculable. It passes like a high squall beyond the horizon. Wind and sea, motion and color, the thunder of a majestic purpose, the lightning of swift ideas, all vanishing to leeward with a tall ship in their midst, done with life and bound to, for the seas of story. The art of seafaring the rigorous discipline, the peerless craftsmanship, the full life that was part and parcel of a closer tradition, these belong to the days of sail and to no other. A natural means of propulsion made natural seamen, but the captain of a steamship is only a navigating officer. 
An amount of mechanical power lies at his command to be pitted against the elements. If the power is not enough, the elements triumph. The engine, not the man, is the master of her fate. The master of a steamship may be all that the sailing ship master was. Many men in steam today, in point of fact, were brought up under sail. We are still in a period of transition. A man of steam, I repeat, may be all that a sailman or sailor was, but he does not need to be. And in the end, when the last men of sail have died and their influence has departed, he will not be, for men as a class do not rise above the exactions of life. The steamship man is a servant, not a master. He takes an order, he does not give it. Thus, we discern at last a great truth that our secret feeling for sailing ships is based on deeper values than those of sentimental attachment or the perception of beauty. It's based on something very real in life, something so true of such immense significance that we hardly dare face the issue. The sailing ship stood for a sociological achievement of the highest order. She stood for a medium whereby men were brought to their fullest development. She stood for a profession where only merit could endure. She stood for the real efficiency of spirit and character. She stood for things that we could not afford to lose. There were days when ships and men advanced together and the supreme beauty of the craft themselves could only have been a reflection of the life they supported. A life brave and clean and full of satisfaction. A life of labor and love. The men who sailed them seemed prosaic. Perhaps the life to them seemed rough and ordinary. It was only the day's work but greatness in action never knows itself. But now we see it better. And when we admire the sailing ship in picture and story, feeling a vague regret and uneasiness, it's not altogether the longing for romance and adventure that stirs us, but also the realization, since but now wholly understood, that a measure of grace has left us with the ships that have sunk beneath the horizon that life is not so rich as the servants of our machines, and that without knowing it, we seem to have let a priceless opportunity fall from our grasp, that ships meant more than materials, and that it all is not entirely well with the enterprise that have left them behind. Josie and Elliot Perkins investigated and found that about a dozen passenger berths were available for paying passengers on the Viking. And they bought tickets and prepared for a sea voyage in an engineless full rig ship across the North Sea, passing close by Denmark and on to Mariham, Finland, in the Gulf of Bothnia, about 400 miles to the east. Not knowing exactly what to expect, they set out from a hotel in London in a cab for the old clipper ship landing place, Victoria Dock. June 29th. Staggered to a taxi laden with far too many packages, which Elliot deplored. However, I held out stoutly for the tea, tomato juice, wheat biscuits, and other lunchies I had purchased in the morning. We told the taxi man, Victoria Docks, whereupon he turned pale and looked aghast and wondered if he had enough petrol. However, we encouraged him, and as we progressed deeper into the city, we stopped and asked our way many times, and with the help of three policemen, finally got to the dock. The ship was lying out in the basin, and some of our passengers-to-be were already aboard, including an English girl who I quickly perceived to be vamping the two men passengers already aboard. I was frightfully impressed with the ship, as she was so tall and splendidly big, much bigger than I thought. A boat came in for us and we carried our own baggage and parcels down some very steep steps to the boat and were rowed out to the ship and given the glad eye by those already aboard. 
I had, by this time, become very self-conscious about the numerous small packages which two sailors staggered up and down the gangway with. As to our passage out, we left Victoria Dock at 6 p.m. under the escort of a stout pilot and two important tugs. It took three hours to tow out of the basin through the lock into the Thames. At 5.50 p.m. they served coffee and cakes. We thought this was meant for supper, and we ate a lot. Going down the Thames was nice, but is a long way. At 8.15 they served tea, which is really supper. It was excellent. Tomato and lettuce salad attractively served neat, and potatoes and gravy and tea and bread. We had developed enormous appetites. After dinner, we strolled on deck while they turned in. June 30th, arose at 4 a.m. to find us still towing, but on deck they were just making sail and getting ready to drop the tow. We had a nice, light, north by east wind. The ship is very beautiful and well kept, and I never realized how marvelous all the sails look when set and what a lively motion such a ship has, for the sails steady her very much. She does not bounce like a steamer or drive, but lifts quietly and rhythmically with a little lap of the waves. At 5.30, I went below and turned in and slept until 7, when the steward cautiously offered me a cup of tea and a biscuit. Thinking it was probably breakfast and counseled by Elliot, I ate all possible bread and turned in again and slept until 9 a.m. when I found a delicious breakfast was served. Spied a large ship off the port bow, which turned out to be the large square rigger of the same line, the Herzogin Cecily, anchored and has been for at least two days as there is no wind. Got busy and polished brass all morning. Everyone working at cleaning the ship after the dirt and dust of the London docks worked at various things, as did the others, till lunchtime. The wind fell calm at 11 a.m., although we had made about 10 miles since passing Sicily, who, in the meantime, had set all her sails. We now drifted backwards for hours, all sails flapping idly, and got near and near Herzogin, Sicily. Went to sleep after lunch and slept until 5 p.m. when we had coffee and cakes. Went on deck to find a light following wind making up. The captain gave us instruction on the charts as to where we were and our course. I skipped rope and bathed the cat's eye, which was sore took pictures of the Cecily, which was up close and all sails set. Climbed in the rigging and then later leaned over the rail and conversed with the Rogers man, who is rather a puzzle, and whose nose has turned purple with sunburn. The Fairham has set her sails for Australia, and New Zealand is making eyes and hay. The two English are very exclusive. Dinner at 8.15. The captain appeared with a large bottle of Holland schnapps and insisted we all have a cocktail glass full, which is pretty stiff. Another excellent supper for high tea of salads, beets, meat, and herring and onions. All have devastating appetites. Went on deck after dinner to walk off the schnapps. Lovely quarter moon, and we are all going along quietly. The Cecily's lights are on our quarter. I don't think she'll pass us, though she's just been in dry dock and had her bottom scraped. And so to bed. It's all the best fun I ever had. The Australian is full of bounce and pep, frightfully American. He is head purser on a P&O boat, and this is his 
busman's holiday. He is very nice anyway. Mr. Rogers has deluged us all with fearful puns. To our shame and delusion, nothing will shut him up. The wind set against us in the afternoon, and we are making very little headway, but who cares? This evening, the moon and the stars were brilliant, and I stayed on deck very late watching them through the rigging and by the sails that go up so mountainously high. Every sail on the ship is set, and it is a lovely sight. July 2nd, Sunday. Rose Latish. Excellent food continues. No work today, but Monday. The entire ship is to be cleaned. Mr. Rogers has taken to flying a kite, which quickly got twisted around the log line. The captain gave him dagger looks and had to haul in the log line, which will lose us a mile or so on our reckoning. Mr. Rogers, very contrite. A number of carrier pigeons have come on board to rest. We have fed them water and wheat cranes. One ate out of my hand. They have bands on their legs and also messages. I suppose they belong to the Carrier Pigeon Club, which works between England, Holland, and Belgium. Ate much too much at all meals, which are delicious and deliciously served. We have started a rope skipping competition. I got up to 80 when my legs gave out. The Ferrum appeared on deck tonight with a flute on which he played to perfection. After supper about 10 in the dusk, the second and third mate came up and played a concert with violins. They were very good. A large ship passed us earlier in the day and won at sunset. We have seen a number of fishing boats, lovely full moon, walked on deck till late before turning in. It's all grand. July 3rd, another perfect day. Tried to catch fish with no success, washed clothes and scrubbed decks. The ferrum has made herself a sailor's hammock instructed by the sailmaker. The captain gave us a lesson in chart reading and showed us how to set a course. A very menacing cloud bank came up before tea. The wind is rising and we are going along very well. A very high barometer. Captain fears a northwest gale. Turned in early as we are in for a rough night. July 4th. Woke up at 3 a.m., went on deck to find us booming along in a very full gale. Everyone hauling ropes and trimming sail. Turned in and slept until breakfast. Terrific sea has come up. Ship rides like a bird. We are creeping along the decks at a 45 degree angle. The Hertz again Cecily is in sight again, and we are ahead of her. Captain had cracked on all possible canvas. At 4 p.m., the main royal blew to ribbons, shortly to be followed by the mizzen topgallant and the main lower topsail. Very exciting. In about an hour and a half, everyone needed to pull ropes, furl sails, and help. Later became very seasick. Blew over the lee rail for a while and then felt better. Ship pitching hard, but going well. I find it very hard to stay in my bunk at this angle as I'm on the weather side of the ship. Turned in early as it was too cold and wet on deck to hang around. The Fareham has been seasick and looks very green. July 5th. Awoke to find a very brilliant clear sky. Made Skagen Point early this a.m. Hertzigan Cecily sighted way ahead of us. She had a better offing and so made the point 10 miles to our windward. Crew bent on new sails during the night. 
flattish all morning, light following air in the afternoon. July 7th, blazing hot day. Got us as far as Hamlet's Castle on Elsinore and then drifted backwards two or three miles. Nothing much done. Did some painting, filled the aft ballast tank as ship would not mind the helm. Drifted near a light ship. Captain in furious temper, very unpleasant. Turned in at dusk, 11 p.m. E.P. and Ferrum sat up all night with the captain. July 8th, still becalmed, have drifted back and forth by a little white church on the shore. Painted ship, everyone hot. Not allowed to go swimming, current much too strong against us. Sailed one mile to Elsinore shore, then drifted back. Dropped anchor in desperation. Sails still set. Party going ashore tomorrow. Heat awful. Very close in cabin and could not sleep. Turned in early. July 9th. Awoke at 5.30. Breakfast at 6. Everyone went ashore except the captain, second officer, and myself, who was fishing. Spent awful day lying prostrate in hammock. Captain Morose, threatening to hang himself from the pipe in my cabin, refused to speak all day or at any meals, all because we are becalmed. Shore party arrived about 7.30. The fair him steering. Signs of alcoholic beverage upon them all. Many bottle of beer brought on board. Eggs, side of beef, other sundries all came from the ship's chandler. Turned in soon after this, just at dusk at 11 p.m. Lovely three-masted bark prompt came by with the current. Counted 111 steamers between 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. going through the straits. July 10th, day of the furious activity, hoisting sails and anchoring, sailing a few yards, drifting by the church again, dropping anchor, hauling anchor, bracing the yards around every hour. No progress made. Doctor became too obnoxious, wears revolting dirty clothes. Little man in a motorboat came out crying, Yo, ya, yo, ya! Swiped all he could lay his hands on. However, got him to go ashore and get a tug from Copenhagen, which arrived belching quantities of smoke at 8 p.m. Many little drinks had to be sipped by the captain of the tug and the captain of the Viking before we could proceed. Captain cheered under the influence of tug and drink and longed to have a party and dance that none of us felt like. The Fairham rescued me from the clutches of the dancing captain, and I went to bed. Decided to go ashore in the tug, as probability of getting to Merriham this weekend, very dubious.